Apologies for the audio quality of this one. I'm literally recording in a bathroom. I'll put a picture of it on screen right now. It's hilarious. Dynamax is F tier. We're dropping that before we even get into the video because I just need to let everyone know that I have good opinions. We'll justify it once we're through my YouTuber stuff. Tier lists. They're a thing on YouTube, and so am I. They also do numbers for some reason. For this reason, I'll be using a tier list to rank each generation of 3D Pokemon's gimmicks. Since Generation 6, Pokemon has introduced a number of new mechanics into each gen of games that drastically changes how Pokemon battles go. Not only do these gimmicks warp the way the game is played, but they tend to be the focus of the entire region for some reason. That's kind of funny, it's like if a country was all on the same page about one thing and they celebrated it. Well, I guess that exists in real life too. Point is, everyone in Galar is a freak about turning their Pokemon into Kaiju, because it's the only place on Earth blessed by the Space Demon to allow it to happen. But not every gimmick is as celebrated by the fan base as they are by the citizens of their home regions. As a matter of fact, a lot of fans just straight up hate these gimmicks. As a competitive player, I have a pretty particular outlook on which gimmicks are more acceptable. So for this reason, today I'll be ranking them in a tier list based on how good they are from a competitive standpoint. And while this is simply the opinion of one dude on the internet, I tend to have my finger on the pulse of the competitive community. How else would I be able to know what to run to get X3 at every tournament ever? Except for the two times I accidentally did really good. So with that, if you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. As a matter of fact, you should really just subscribe right now because I have a playlist full of content just like this that you can watch once this video ends. And if you think you're subscribed, do me a favor and double check because only like half my viewers actually are. With that, let's get into the video. But not before the gamer subs ad. It's 20 seconds. You can skip it if you just tap the right side of your screen three times. And yeah, just leave a like because I warned you. This channel is partnered with Gamersups. If you want to support my work and get great tasting drinks, you can order Gamersups through my link in the description down below or with code MOXIEBOOSTER at checkout for 10% off. Gamersups is a caffeinated product that I recommend only to my 18 plus viewers, but my link will send you to their caffeine free product section just in case. Every product purchased through my link supports my channel financially, so I'd really appreciate the support. Now back to the video. In F tier, we have Dynamax. Oh, Dynamax. What happened? Yes, turning your Pokemon into a Kaiju and having it hurl super powerful attacks into the opposing Kaiju is visually pretty appealing. The toilet's making noise. <laughs> it's visually pretty appealing, but even from a visual standpoint, there are some issues. Seeing the same moves over and over again gets repetitive, and animations from non-Dynamax Pokemon into Dynamax Pokemon just become little boops and baps, which is kind of lame. But these are small visual nitpicks. The issues with Dynamax really arise when you get into just how drastically it changes the game. In standard Pokemon, there's a wide variety of playstyles like Balance, Psy Spam, Tailwind Offense, Parish Trap, and yes, even Stall. But Dynamax shifts the game into a place where only Hyper Offense is really all that strong. And this is by design. Dynamax takes one of your Pokemon and doubles its HP stat while turning all of its offensive moves into nukes that hit partially through Protect with a secondary effect tacked on. Yeah, you managed to survive the onslaught from Dynamax Groudon, but now you have to deal with a regular Groudon at double special defense, and Sun is still active because they clicked a fire move when you set up Rain. These moves were just straight up slightly weaker Z moves, but with sprinkles on top. You can toss out a super powerful Max Quake to knock out an opposing Pokemon while simultaneously boosting your special defense stat. And while at least offensive boosting moves like Max Ooze and Max Knuckle capped out at 90 base power, for some reason Max Airstream, which boosts the speed stat of the user, didn't have a cap. So Pokemon like Dragapult and Landris began to run flying moves to increase their speed stat to outspeed and sweep opposing teams even after Max ended. People will argue that Dynamax allowed for weaker Pokemon to find niche uses in competitive, but this isn't really true since while yes you could use weaker Pokemon to Dynamax, it's still a rich get richer environment where you'd get far more value by performing the same strategy with a Pokemon like Landorus or Regieleki. Besides that, the strategy in question that made weaker Pokemon strong was almost always just slapping a weakness policy on them and side targeting them when they Dynamax to activate it. Then they would sweep, usually by spamming Max Airstream because that move is broken. One of the most unforgivable things that Dynamax did was turn weakness policy from a niche item that Pokemon with good bulk like Metagross or Tyranitar could use into one of the most randomly placed items ever. Since Dynamax made weakness policy sets viable on literally every Pokemon except Shedinja. It was rare to go more than one game on ladder without facing self-target weakness policy Pokemon. Most notably of these is GMAX Colossal, one of several Pokemon which received a busted GMAX move. Gigantamaxing was like Dynamaxing, but certain Pokemon got a visual change and an exclusive move on top of it. In the case of Colossal, Venusaur, Blastoise, and Charizard, they got a max move of their primary typing, which would deal massive damage and continue to deal one-sixth of the opposing team's health and damage for four turns, if they weren't the typing of said move, quickly chipping everything down into range of a follow-up. These moves defined the game, and these Pokemon quickly became some of the most spammed Pokemon on ladder and in tournaments. One last thing I want to bring up before wrapping up the Dynamax segment is the fact that Dynamax being a once-per- 
same effect that lasted only three turns, made sleep absolutely broken. Pokemon like Coil Hypnosis Milotic, Sleep Powder Venusaur, and Yawn Gastrodon were invaluable because they could potentially shut down an entire Dynamax instantly, thus allowing the user to retaliate with their own Dynamax Pokemon while the opponent couldn't fully defend from the onslaught. This might have been the most unfun mechanic from a competitive player's perspective ever, and this sentiment is shared by the vast majority of competitive players only with a small number of outspoken Dynamax apologists. The issue is that this was the mechanic present in Sword and Shield, the game that brought the most new players to the competitive scene, simply due to boredom and the lockdowns during 2020. So for a long time, this was the only gimmick that players knew, and because of this, many of them have a much more positive outlook on it due to nostalgia. But as someone with experience going back to 2015, yeah, this isn't it, let's hope it never returns, into F tier. There's nothing in D tier. D tier exists solely to show the gap between Dynamax and literally anything else. In C tier, we have Z-Moves. Z-Moves were one of the most mechanically interesting gimmicks ever implemented in a competitive Pokemon. The last time a generation's gimmick was balanced by requiring the user to hold an item to activate it. Z-Moves had some pretty cool stuff under the hood. By having your Pokemon hold a Z-Crystal of a particular type, it would allow them to power up any one move of that type. So for example, a Gyarados holding Flyanium Z could turn its move bounce into a one-time use flying type nuke of a move called Supersonic Sky Strike. Oh yeah, and all the Z moves had silly names. Some of my favorites include Pulverizing Pancake, Clangorous Soul Blaze, Devastating Drake, and of course, Let's Snuggle Forever. Besides being a super powerful attack, Z-moves were also not fully blockable. Using Protect into a Z-move would result in the damage being cut drastically, but damage would still be done, meaning Z-moves could be used as a guaranteed way to pick up KOs on weakened Pokemon through Protect. Or in the case of the Swords Dance Garchomp from World's Finals, just one-shotting a Mon through Protect anyways. If we stopped there, Z-moves would already be just a toned down and balanced version of what Dynamax had going on, making them kind of whatever and a little annoying at worst. But Z-moves had a bit of sauce to them. If you used a Z-move to power up a non-damaging move, that move would also be powered up, just in a niche and interesting way. Take for example, Ghost DMZ Destiny Bond. This move would not only apply the normal effect of Destiny Bond, but it'd also apply the Follow Me effect, forcing opposing Pokemon to target into it, or Z-Splash, which would raise the user's attack set by three stages. Yeah, Splash just became Super Swords Dance. There's a wide variety of wacky effects that the Z-status moves could apply to a Pokemon, and many of these opened up new strategies for a wide variety of teams, making Z-moves a more interesting concept. We even had exclusive Z-moves for particular Pokemon. These Z-moves would power up one specific move on a species of Pokemon to give them a new effect. Extreme Evo Boost caused Eevee to summon all of its evolutions to give it plus two in its stats, allowing it to sweep or more often pass them to another Pokemon. Finger Soul Blaze on Kamoa would hit both opposing Pokemon for massive damage while giving Kamoa an Omni Boost and Pulverizing Pancake would make Snorlax sit on something. These moves opened up a door to brand new strategies for teams to revolve around, and while they could be an annoying out of nowhere one shot button, they were ultimately not that bad overall. Also this mechanic gave us light that burns the sky, frankly the hardest name for a Pokemon move ever with the coolest animation that will never be topped. So we're just gonna sit and watch it in its entirety right now. In B tier, we have Mega Pokemon. Okay, get your tomatoes thrown and your rude comments out of the way, but B tier is an overall positive rating. Are Megas the single most iconic gimmick ever introduced into Pokemon? Yes, but competitively, they have some drawbacks that keep them from being any higher on the list. You see, in Gen 6, Pokemon saw fit to make it so Mega Pokemon could be used to give new forms and breathe new life into old favorites. This, in practice, wasn't executed as well as it could be. Mega Evolutions required that the Pokemon hold their specific Mega Stone so they could, on command, Mega Evolve into the new form, which would grant them a new ability and sometimes a new type, and 100 more points distributed among their base stats. This would be fine and dandy if it weren't for the fact that giving Mega Forms to Pokemon like B and Pidgeot to buff them is really undercut by the fact that they also gave Mega Forms to already strong Pokemon like Salamence, Metagross, and what? Rayquaza. Why, why would you even do that? It, it really didn't need the buff. What? And it doesn't need a Mega. Why would you? Ever, it doesn't need a Mega Stone. Like why would you ever use another Mega? Ultimately, while Megas were good for making some specific low tiers like Beedrill, Ampharos, and Sceptile much stronger in a competitive landscape, at the end of the day, balance wasn't their objective. It was merch sales. And what sells more than mega forms of fan favorites like Garchomp and Gardevoir? So for this reason, Megas somewhat fail as a way to provide better balance in Pokemon across the board. 
but in battle, they weren't as intrusive as other gimmicks. Yes, you were effectively forced to pick at least one Pokemon from the pool of Megas to be on your team as somewhat of a team captain that everything revolved around, but there was a wide pool of Megas, so this wasn't all that limiting. We had plenty of great Mega archetypes by VGC 2018, like Minectric Control Teams, Gengar Parish Teams, Mega King's Chalk Core, and Charizard Wise Sun. And this is only scratching the surface, as most Mega Pokemon did have established archetypes around them that players could easily pick up and learn. It was almost like having a main in a fighting game or a hero shooter. Yes, Megas were a mostly welcome gimmick in VGC, but there's still a large number of players who insist that Megas ultimately harm game balance and limit creativity. So for that reason, they land at B tier. Spoilers, there's nothing at S, because genuinely pure Pokemon with no gimmick is about as fun and as balanced as the game gets. But Terrasilization lands itself in A tier. Why? Well, Terrasilization manages to walk the fine line of preserving the feeling of playing pure Pokemon while still introducing a fun and new mechanic to the game. Terrasilization allows for any one Pokemon on the player's team to turn into its Terra type. This causes the Terrasilized Pokemon to defensively gain the resistances, weaknesses, and immunities of its new type while losing all of its old types. However, offensively, it keeps its old boost to moves while gaining an additional one from its Terra. If the user terrestrializes into one of their existing types, it will have that type of move's same type attack bonus increased from 1.5 times to a 2 times multiplier, granting it much greater power. This mechanic, while still kind of being a rich get richer mechanic, wasn't nearly as blatant as any other gimmick, as literally every Pokemon has a situation where it wants to change its typing, and the terrestrialization you choose can be for a number of offensive purposes or a wide range of defensive utilities like preventing Spore with Grass type, preventing Prankster moves with Dark type, preventing Burn with Fire type, or any resistance into an incoming move with whatever type is necessary. As a matter of fact, the best Terra users tend to be those who can offensively Terra while dropping a bad defensive typing, like Terra Fairy Fluttermane, who now resists Dark moves, or Terra Flying Landorus, who will no longer drop to a chilly morning breeze. Point is, Terra is able to provide players with a gimmick which allows them the greatest skill expression without being too intrusive of a concept, because at the end of the day, all you're doing is really changing the type of a Pokemon. The core mechanics and skill involved in base Pokemon is still there. However, I will admit that Terra is somewhat carried by the fact that we have open team sheets, allowing you to see which Terras are an option on which Pokemon on your opponent's team. So, in closed team sheet, they're a little bit worse, but they're still much better than Megas in my opinion. And it's genuinely the closest thing we got to a gimmick which helps the little guys out. Into A tier it goes. But that's my ranking of each generation's gimmicks based on how good they are for competitive play. I'd make this outro longer, but I'm sleepy and I'm playing a regional in 7 hours, so leave a like and stuff. Watch my other videos, especially the buffing Gen 3 vid. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, it'd mean the world to me. If you want to support me further, you can check out my Patreon page or become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button below the video. This gets you sneak peeks at future videos and even some bonus content. You also see your name at the end of my videos, like all these lovely people. Special thanks to my most boosted supporters, Ant Media UK, Avatar67, and Kayla Thompson for their generous pledges. Another way to support me is to check out all the videos in the playlist on screen right now. I know you'll find something in there that you'll enjoy. I also have a second channel where I talk about the current VGC metagame trends and a Twitch channel where I stream, both of which are going to be in the description. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!